<laughs> I was 15. And uh, I remember you as an excited person, excited by what you were seeing. And what you were seeing were wild animals, the most of which we had never dreamt of. How did that person, what was the journey that led you from there to an understanding of and campaigning about climate change? He has reached every continent on Earth and is one of the most traveled men in history. I've always believed that few people will protect the natural world if they don't first love and understand it. As many people as possible, across all cultures and languages, must understand the natural world and our place within it. I think stories and storytelling is, is a very important part of programme making. You have to be very clever to do a, a programme with no story at all. You want the viewer to know, hang on, what's going to happen in next, what is going to happen now? What's going to happen? He solved that problem, but he's facing another problem. What's he going to do? Uh, and that's what, that engages people. For more than six decades now, he has been the voice of modern natural history programmes and has inspired millions by bringing the natural world into our homes, teaching them about diverse lifestyles, behaviours and adaptations of living things. His incredible journey and illustrious career have made him an inspiration to millions. Nature has been there for us when we needed it the most. Yet we have allowed our natural world and climate to reach breaking point. The natural world is not just nice to have. It fundamentally matters to each and every one of us. Thanks to a life marked by a relentless desire to explore, innovate and enlighten, his impact is astounding. Right now, we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Nature once determined how we survive. Now we determine how nature survives. We are citizens of the world and we must recognize that. David Frederick Attenborough was born the second of three boys on May the 8th, 1926 in Isleworth, West London, England but grew up with his two older brothers in Leicester. His father was a university principal, and together with his wife, Mary, they took in two Jewish girls who had fled Germany during World War II and treated them like family. The Attenborough brothers' chosen careers would take them all far from their hometown. Richard, David's older brother, would become an Academy Award-winning actor and director and the youngest, John, would become a top motor executive. As a child, David collected fossils, stones and bird eggs, and his fascination with the wilderness and natural world developed early. The Midlands is a beautiful part of, of Britain, uh, and it has marvellous fossils in it. Ammonites, uh, big she coiled shells like that, as big as that. Um, and I used to spend a lot of time looking for fossils uh, and then watching foxes and rabbits and birds and so on. I wanted to climb Everest. Um, when I was about eight, I thought that was the thing I wanted to do more than anything else because at that time, nobody had climbed Everest. After graduating from high school, he was awarded a scholarship to study natural sciences at Clare College in Cambridge. Upon completing his studies in 1947, he served for two years in the Royal Navy. 
1949, he returned to London and found work as an editor for an educational publisher. In 1950, Attenborough married Jane Oriel, and the couple stayed together until her death in 1997 from a brain hemorrhage. They had two children together, a son and a daughter. In 1952, after he completed a training programme, the BBC offered him a job in a new business they thought might have some future. It was called television. He began working there as a producer, making the beginning of a milestone career, both at the BBC and beyond. Uh, I think that, uh, that, that we have a very precious national uh, asset, uh, which can be likened to a theatre in the middle of a town, and just one theatre. Uh, and I think it is the obligation of the people who run that theatre to, to make sure that, not that they write all the plays themselves, write all the jokes themselves, and give all the sort of editorials themselves, all the speeches at the end of the evening, but that they go out into the, into the town and find the most intelligent and the most dramatic and the funniest and a whole range of people, and make sure that they can get on and they have a fair crack of the whip and that they do it to the best of their possible uh, abilities. That's our responsibility. We also have one other responsibility, which is to make sure that we don't waste that asset by letting, putting on such people as to leave the hall 90% empty. I think that the part, that the, the, the worthwhile kind of power that there is in broadcasting is with the men who make programmes. David was soon associated with various natural history programs, such as his first TV show, Animal Patterns, and then ZooQuest in 1954, which combined live studio presentation with footage shot on location for the first time. The film crews travelled far and wide to capture animals on film, and David was starting to take small steps forward on the path towards his ultimate destiny. ZooQuest established the general standards for modern nature documentaries. The show was so successful that it led the BBC to establish its world-renowned Natural History Unit in Bristol in 1957. In the early 1960s, Attenborough resigned from the BBC to study for a postgraduate degree in social anthropology at the London School of Economics, interweaving his study with further filming, but he returned to the BBC before he could finish the degree. From 1965 to 1969, Attenborough was the controller of BBC Two and later was named its director of programming. During his tenure, he oversaw the first ever colour broadcasts in Europe, rushing to beat rival German broadcasters by three weeks. I, I think that it's very important that the person who has control, direct control uh, over uh, television should know about programmes and know about them fairly intimately. I mean, if we are, we are nothing unless we do programmes. Um, and if it's a choice between an efficiently produced bad programme and a very inefficiently produced good programme, there's no question as to what we should go for. We should go for the second. Now, if you are really going to get this um, working, you've got to have a man who understands programmes and programme makers who is in direct control. By expanding the station's natural history content on screens in ways never seen before, he helped inaugurate a new kind of TV documentary. He initiated a wide range of programmes, including Live Snooker, Match of the Day, The Likely Lads and Mastermind. So that really what we're talking about is one network which is mainstream and another one which is the supplement, which is the addition, which is the spice, which is the extra bit. And so what viewers, I hoped always would do, would be to, to live, as it were, most of the time with BBC One and go to BBC Two for those very specialist things which made all the difference. 
In 1917, in recognition of his contributions, the British Academy honoured him with its Desmond Davis Award for his services to television. Yet the tenacious 28-year-old could not shake the passion that had remained with him since his youth, and he was seeking new ways to make films and a life outside the studio. So in 1972, he resigned again from his post at the BBC to follow his dreams into the wild. Well, I don't know, um, without um, uh, sounding uh, pretentious, um, but I, I, all I know is that living in a city and uh, sitting in an office from 9 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night and watching television till midnight, uh, leave something out and something that's fairly important. Uh, and I, I just want to see a bit of that again, that's all. After leaving the BBC, Attenborough began writing and producing various series. One series in particular had an impact on how people viewed wildlife. Attenborough's greatest success yet would come in 1976, when Life on Earth first aired. A programme of this scale and ambition had never been attempted before. It was one of the first times people had seen wildlife up close with a presenter, and it changed their perception. The 96-episode series gave a unique insight into the lives of animals and plants, the series was, in fact, one of the most fascinating stories ever told. The evolution of life on our planet. Nobody knows exactly how many different kinds of animals there are here. Wherever you look, there's life. The series took Attenborough and his crews around the globe, using innovative camera techniques and stunning photography to show animals in their natural habitats it gained an estimated viewing audience of more than 500 million worldwide. Immeasurable in terms of sales or impact, the show set the standards for the modern nature documentary, and he showcased one of the most memorable moments in television history. While filming, Attenborough traveled to Rwanda, where he made an instant connection with the area's charismatic mountain gorillas. Far from being uh, nervous, I truly mean this, I, I really felt that this was the greatest compliment that I'd ever been paid by anybody or anything, uh, that they trusted us and were friendly enough to us uh, to come and do that. It was just um, breathtaking. Animals nearly always n let you know uh, if they're going to attack you. If you know enough, as I was saying, if you know enough about animals, you should be able to know when an elephant is going to charge. He will, he will let you know. He will put out his ears. He will probably make a dummy charge. Now, if you're very silly, then you can persuade him to charge and he, he could well kill you. He has also described Borneo as one of his favorite destinations on Earth. I remember wake, waking up one morning on, in Borneo and the top of my mosquito net was going up and down. I could see the moon through it. And on this mosquito, there was this huge rat and I could see underneath, I could see his long little white teeth coming <laughs> closer and closer to my face. And I didn't care for that either. The success of life on Earth made Attenborough a household name. In the decade that followed, he went on to make a number of series that explored the botanical world and the life of birds. In 2001, he gave an insight into a bizarre new world when he narrated the series that introduced millions to the wonders of the deep sea, the Blue Planet. It was the first time some extraordinary species, including the Dumbo octopus and the anglerfish, were captured on film. He also wrote, produced, and narrated numerous other award-winning programmes, including the BBC's Wildlife on One, which ran for over 250 episodes from 1997 to 2005. 
and at its peak drew a weekly audience of 8 to 10 million. The viewers then witnessed another breakthrough in broadcasting when Attenborough narrated the 2006 series Planet Earth, the most expensive wildlife documentary ever made by the BBC and its first ever HD show. Oh, I, um, for me personally, uh, I get a great kick from the thought that I started making programmes with the with clockwork cameras, you know, way back 50 years ago, um, and now uh, I've gone all through through HD and through colour and so on, and now I'm in 3D. So it's very nice to have been there for the whole history of uh, of television picture making. In 2010, he realised his lifelong ambition when he reached the North Pole for the first time at 83. While filming in the Arctic Circle for Frozen Planet, a new BBC nature series highlighting the impact of global warming on the Earth's extreme regions, the naturalist and presenter made it to the top of the world. <laughs> The BBC faced controversy in 2011 when the fifth episode of the £16 million highly praised programme Frozen Planet cut from footage of a polar bear on the Arctic ice to a female bear inside a den tending to her newborn cubs. As the image shifts, the presenter, Sir David Attenborough, says, But on lee slopes beneath the snow, new lives are beginning. If they blur these boundaries, they, they, they do run the risk of people losing confidence in what they're seeing. The broadcasting regulator is now investigating a number of complaints over the issue, but the BBC is emphatic on this. It says that the narration was carefully worded so as not to mislead and talked in general about bears in the wild. The producer, it says, even detailed how and where it was filmed on the website. The BBC was accused of fakery by furious viewers after it was revealed that the footage had been shot in a Dutch zoo using fake snow instead of in the Arctic. Some newspaper reports claimed this was potentially misleading for viewers, who would assume all the footage was from the wild, and the programme was accused of not being entirely open. The BBC was forced to defend itself and said the narration had been deliberately very general, so viewers would not assume it referred to the specific cubs. The BBC editorial guidelines on wildlife programmes, in fact, say that when it is impractical or unsafe to film something in the wild, it can be editorially and ethically justified to use captive animals. They add, but we must never claim that such sequences were shot in the actual location depicted in the film. The corporation denied misleading viewers, but took the decision to re-edit the episode, as well as remove the original broadcast online. In the edited episode, Attenborough's words were replaced with a musical score. He also defended the scenes by telling ITV, if you had tried to put a camera in the wild, in a polar bear den, she would either have killed the cub, or she would have killed the cameraman, one or the other. You know, I think a, a, an interest in the natural world brings huge pleasure to life, you know? Uh, and it, it's also very important, really. I mean, we are dependent on the natural world and, and, and an affection and respect for the natural world is a crucial thing. Being a wildlife filmmaker is not a job without risk. And to take the audience on a journey while telling an accurate narrative means that sometimes not every scene can be shot in the wild. For David and his film crew, it was a job that required dedication, skill, patience and endurance. Frozen Planet took four years to make and, in the end, the BBC produced an hour of it. Over the years, they had to take risks in order to film dramatic scenes and some of the most mind-blowing footage of the natural world ever seen.
In 2015, after nearly 60 years, Attenborough returned to his most magical place on Earth, in the Great Barrier Reef series. He dived 1,000 foot in a submersible off the Australian coast to film previously unseen parts of the Great Barrier Reef, breaking the record for the deepest dive on the reef. I first went to the Barrier Reef in 1957. Uh, I was on my way to New Guinea, and uh, it seemed to, uh, a marvellous opportunity. I dreamt, dreamt about the Barrier Reef as a boy. And so we um, went from Cairns and went northwards and went all the way up to Rain Island. And in 1957, very few people went to Rain Island. I mean, it was the remote, the remote, the remote. Um, and uh, it's still pretty remote. But going up the coast, the east coast now, uh, compared with them, back then there was hardly any human habitation halfway up and beyond. But now, of course, there are people everywhere. Television has changed beyond recognition. You know, I started when television was a monopoly, uh, it belonged only to the BBC, it was all you could see, and we were only on the air for about three or four hours a day. Well, now you tell me how many networks there are. You tell me how many hundred hours of television is available to everybody every 24 hours. We are citizens of the world, and we must recognize that. The problems are just piling up. We can never do enough. Uh, we have still got a lot of people to convince in this world. There are two, at least two, if not three, large nations in the world that still don't accept that we are ruining the world. They will not accept that. During his lifetime of achievement, David Attenborough has earned a myriad of honors, including three Emmy Awards for outstanding narration. In 2002, he received the Order of Merit from Queen Elizabeth II and holds at least 31 honorary degrees from British universities, including Oxford and Cambridge. In 2022, he was honoured with the prestigious UN Champions of the Earth Lifetime Achievement Award. In addition, he has been knighted twice and had species named after him. Your ability to communicate the beauty and vulnerability of our natural environment remains unequaled as you and your team have engaged and enthused many people, young and old, to appreciate and preserve our world's oceans. It's kind of evident that you are now regarded throughout this country as the Cliff Richard <laughs> of the natural world. Uh, you, you seem like, you know, the, the Peter Pan of your field. Your enthusiasm, your energy seems boundless. How do you manage to keep going? You're a lesson to us all. Uh, it's, um, you know, I've got the best job going. Uh, and to be able to go around anywhere in the world and see the most marvellous things is just the luckiest thing that anybody could wish for. And so it makes you get up in the morning. The moment of crisis has come. We can no longer prevaricate. The temperatures of the Earth are increasing. That is a major national, international catastrophe. Um, and to say, uh, oh, it's nothing to do with the climate, is palpably nonsense. Um, and what how has been affecting the climate? We have. We know that perfectly well. So that we have to, we have to realise that this is not playing games. This is not just having nice little debates and arguments and then coming away with a compromise. This is an urgent problem that has to be solved. Uh, and what is more, we know how to do it. That's the, the, the paradoxical thing, that we're refusing to, to take steps that we know have to be taken. And every year that passes makes those steps more and more difficult to achieve. People can see the problem, particularly young people can see the problem. Um, and, and that must force governments to take action. As a passionate environmental campaigner, Attenborough has warned us of the fragile nature of our planet for many years. Uh, we are now interfering with the natural world in such a wholesale way 
that we are risking the, fer the fertility of the world. We are risking um, the continued existence of this Earth as a fertile planet. And if we go on uh, felling the tropical rainforest, um, pouring insecticide into rivers, uh, we will be reducing the Earth's um, potential, the Earth's power to grow food for ourselves. So that the, the situation is a very serious one. Today, there is very dramatic evidence of global warming. And as time passed, Attenborough became aware that the animals and habitats he was filming were under threat. At the age of 90, Attenborough was still producing natural history and films and had no intention of stopping, even though he continued to enchant and delight people with programs such as Planet Earth 2, The Green Planet, Dynasties and Frozen Planet 2. Many of his later documentaries included a more serious message and addressed issues such as global warming, population growth and the extinction of endangered species. His work on Blue Planet 2 also alerted the world of the devastating effect that plastic has on marine life. The series includes a scene where a young mother pilot whale is carrying her dead baby, which the scientists believe died due to toxic shock. The making of Blue Planet 2 involved 6,000 hours of underwater filming and required new technology to be developed. While the vast majority of the filming was done in the wild, some crucial behavior could only be captured on film in controlled or laboratory conditions. It would be certainly the case if, in fact, that Planet Earth 2 was the only natural history program that the BBC does. Um, then that's a very, very long way from the truth. Martin Hugh Gaines himself has got a new series that's just started, and he's, he will certainly be talking about conservation and the importance of conservation. And, but people, it's get very difficult to get people to, uh, to protect things and work for things and give to support to things that they've never seen or they don't understand or totally mysterious. Um, you, people won't protect things if they don't know about them. Um, and it's very important that they should not only know about them, but understand the way they work. Um, and uh, the, the natural, the, the human beings are dependent upon the natural world for every mouthful of food they eat and every breath of air they take. Um, and they ought to be aware um, how dependent upon they are, but also how precious the natural world is. Well, uh, the BBC does lots of different programmes and, and they certainly do programmes in which you see how splendid things are and how fascinating they are and how valuable they are um, and uh, also um, that they're in danger. You don't have to do... You don't turn on a television programme and say, yet again, it's lovely but it's all your fault and you're destroying... That is not the way in which you actually get support for the sort of cause which I think is crucial for the world. It's not a win or lose situation. We, we, it, it's not as simple as that. Uh, but we are not losing as badly as we might. I think that's about, about as good as you can say. Um, but I think we are changing our habits. Uh, I think the world is waking up to what we've done for the planet. Uh, and, and young people, as we know, are demanding that things should be done about it. In 2019, he narrated Netflix's eight-part documentary series, Our Planet. The viewers were so amazed by breathtaking scenes of natural beauty that it led them to ask whether they were looking at real footage. As usual, the series looked at the natural world in all its glory, but also contained a strong warning to help stop climate change. The eight-part Our Planet series aims to reach a billion people around the world. It celebrates the species and habitats that still remain and reveals what must be protected to ensure both people and nature thrive. I've always believed that few people will protect the natural world if they don't first love and understand it. Many sequences in the Our Planet series reveal nature at its most fascinating and delightful. Others 
proof that good things do indeed come to those who wait, often for a very long time, as the many talented cameramen and women who've recorded all kinds of wonders for us know only too well. But what really makes our planet stand out is the clear driving story that runs through the entire series. The natural world is not just nice to have, it fundamentally matters to each and every one of us. This has been a true labor of love for hundreds of filmmakers, cinema photographers, conservationists, editors, musicians, production and teams, all of whom have brought their best work to this most important story that there is. A story that could not be more universal or more timely. The ability to tell that story in almost every country on Earth at the same time via Netflix brings the possibility of an unprecedented global understanding of the one place that we all call home. I think it's 2019, I think it's time, right? I think that um, there's a level of awareness and consciousness and I think that people are ready to um, certainly explore the wonders and the beauty of the world and that's the thing we're so excited about being a service that's available in 190 countries and being able to simultaneously release this to all of the members around the world at the same time hopefully creating a cultural moment but for people to really revel in the beauty of the natural world that we completely share we share all the same water the same air um, but also to acknowledge that humankind has had a real effect on the earth Right? And so I think it's about um, being able to be conscious of what we've done, um, take accountability for it, but also really lean into these incredibly hopeful stories that Sir David has brought to the surface as well about various species that were really on the brink of extinction that we've been able to, through conscious and collective efforts, bring back into, uh, into really vital populations. So I think, that, um, I think that it's an exciting time and people are, are looking forward to understand and sort of the realities that they live in and sort of a path towards replenishing the world. Now, uh, you mentioned in the first episode that what we do in the next 20 years is crucial. So in 20 years from today, what would be the message that you would send to us today? Care for the planet. Um, don't be extravagant. Don't waste. Uh, do what you can to uh, cut out uh, unnecessary expenditure. Uh, don't eat more than you need. Don't travel more than you need. Um, all those things. Just just careful, just be responsible, careful citizens of this planet, which is our only home, and for the creatures that live in it. And what is, what is different to those of our viewers who haven't seen it yet? What is different this time around? What, what's maybe the groundbreaking new stuff you've got here? Oh, there, there are a lot of sequences you've never seen before. Uh, of course there are. Um, and some of them are, are so spectacular you wouldn't believe. We are now making much better natural history films. I mean, I've been in the business what, for 60, 70 years. And the things that we can do now, there's nothing we can't do. We can film at night, we can film the bottom of the sea, we can speed it up, slow things down, uh, and, and we can put up in the sky, you can get a drone and get fantastic shots. And I think that there are stuff in this secret, in this uh, series, uh, shots of such staggering in, uh, beauty, but also drama. Uh, you'll be amazed. As of March 2021, 100 million households had watched the series. That same year, Sir David presented Seven Worlds, One Planet, making the first time a programme explored all the continents in a single series. In this documentary that we've never seen before, there are new species, there's new behaviour, there's new locations. So there's animals which I've never seen before. I've worked in TV for 20 years, I've worked as a biologist for 30 years, and I've never seen some of those animals, and I've never seen the behaviour, and we've gone to places on the planet that we've never been to before. It's difficult, I don't want to spoil the, the experience for all the viewers, but there's certain um, continents, so we, we feature Europe, and you think, well, I mean, I'm from Europe, a number of our audience are from Europe, and we feel like we've seen it all before, but actually there's animals there which I didn't even know existed. We have a, a sequence of, of hamsters in a, in a graveyard in the middle of Vienna. I didn't even know that hamsters live wild, but they're living wild all over Europe. I think viewers keep coming back to these big landmark series, these big wildlife series like Blue Planet and Planet Earth, 
because we, we're on our phones, we're on our tablets, we're living in cities a lot more, but actually we're still really connected to the, to the, to the wilderness and, and to the natural world, and I think that's something that's been in us for thousands of years. What's new about this series is we've got um, really strong conservation in every single episode, and we've never done that before. We've never gone this far, taken a really big step, so I think people will feel for those... Um, for the animals that they see and the impact that humans are having on those animals. Thank you very much, Ian. Good morning, every Good morning everybody. Well, Pri Prime Minister Conte Giuseppe, uh, Sir David, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm thrilled to, launch, uh, to welcome you all to the, to the launch of what I hope will be a defining year of action for our country and indeed for our planet uh, in, on tackling climate change, but also on protecting the natural world. It's just so encouraging to know that the present government has declared this year, the year, not of talking about it, not of alarming people, not of warning, but of action. And it's a huge encouragement to those of us who've been worrying about this problem for a very long time to know that now the government of this country is going to do something in Glasgow at the end of this year. I look forward to it. Then COVID hit and the COP26 climate change conference set to take place in April 2020 was postponed to 2021. In 2020, a life on our planet came out as Attenborough's witness statement and vision for the future. I think it's a change in mindset. I mean, there are lots of things you can do in your daily life, but they all come after you change your mindset about um, the situation and the future. And, uh, there's all sorts of positions that people have uh, accidentally, really. They, they may not know enough. Uh, they may decide that they don't want to um, believe it or just even think about it. Um, but I think what we've tried to put in the film is that there's a very aspirational future in which we are sustainable. It's a place that we should be aiming for. There's no downside to it. Um, so therefore, there's no barriers to adopting the practices that we need to adopt to get there. So I think it's a mindset. It's, uh, it's going to be OK as long as we all head down that path. Well, it's that 50 years when David was out there recording all, all of this is the greatest change in the world, isn't it, of humanity and everything. It's all happened in his, in his lifetime. And absolutely, it's the perfect story arc to explain the predicament we're in, we're in now, and I think when when we originally talked about it, that was the structure. It was it was your life gave us this arc to really explain to people how we've come to this place, and also to explain how to get out of it. My personal feeling is that what we want to do is to engage government and business in these. They're, they're such huge things, and we're seeing with the whole coronavirus. Once the world gets frightened of something action happens very, very quickly. So you have to ask yourself, why aren't we taking action to preserve the natural world at a crucial time? Why isn't the natural world put into quarantine and allowed to recover and fulfill all the things it needs to do to get the world back on, back on balance? When humanity is frightened enough of an issue, we do amazing things very quickly. We just have to get serious about this environmental crisis, it's not just climate change, it's the, it's the destruction, the fabric of the natural world, and we just need to get real about it and do what we know humans can do, and that's act quickly. Uh, and it's only in retrospect that you see how lucky you've been and how lucky you have been in the history of broadcasting, but also the history of the world, the history of uh, uh, science, uh, the history of awareness, and the history of the way in which the Homo sapiens has increased in such vast numbers and with such huge power to, to uh, put the whole planet into, into hazard. That's, uh, I could never have believed that would happen. And I find myself here surprised, actually, that this film has been made, really. Um, it's the last, last major th statement I'm going to make. In fact, it's, it's more than that. It's the first major statement I have made um, in which I've been able to have the freedom to speak of which I have. 
Attenborough has tirelessly released new documentaries and, despite his age, continued to dedicate his life to celebrating and protecting our planet and inspiring generations to maintain the beauty and balance of our natural world. If we damage the natural world and reduce its value and reduce its... we damage ourselves. Uh, so, uh, looking after the country, butterflies are only one thing that we're talking about. We, the, the countryside as a whole and the natural world as a whole is absolutely crucial to our very being. In order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris climate accord. It was a catastrophe, um, um, but and uh, all of us were deeply downcast by that. Some wiser ones were saying, well, he, he will change his mind or he, the, the, it's not as bad as that. And they, uh, it looks as though they may have been correct. I mean, this morning's news uh, is that he's, he's rethinking. The veteran broadcaster believed that the best way to save the world was to show it to us. And he did that for nearly half a century. Nature has been there for us when we needed it the most. Yet we have allowed our natural world and climate to reach breaking point, with almost half of our UK wildlife in decline and some of our best loved species at risk of extinction. As the climate emergency intensifies, the threat to life on Earth becomes ever greater. But we have the choice of a better and wilder future. A future where wildlife thrives alongside people. A future where nature helps us in the fight against climate change. We know that we need to stop burning fossil fuels, but we must also recognize the role of nature in helping us turn the tide. We must bring wildlife and wild places back on an ambitious scale in turn creating new livelihoods and protecting the planet for future generations. Our lives depend on it. Nature has extraordinary powers to lock up carbon dioxide, to provide clean air and water, to help protect us from flooding and extreme weather, and to provide the food which sustains us. For decades, the wildlife trusts have been leading the way to put nature into recovery, bringing back precious salt marsh and peatlands and reintroducing beavers, our natural water engineers. But we can't do it alone. We need bold action, supporting local communities and landowners to create thriving and connected wild places on land and at sea. It's not too late to win the fight against the climate and nature crises. Given the chance, nature can recover in the most remarkable ways. But we need to act quickly. The time is now to create a wilder future. I'm uh, always very interested by the, um, uh, the fascination with humans, uh, that humans have, uh, is there life on other planets? And so we send spacecraft off to Mars to go and see if we can find remnants of the tiniest, most insignificant bacteria that might ever have lived on Mars. And yet on our planet, where we have wonderful life and huge diversity of life, we treat it as if it absolutely doesn't matter. And uh, that's a supreme paradox, that we should be so fascinated by the prospect of life on other planets, but on the planet where we live, we actually don't pay it any attention at all. People can see the effects of climate change. This is all about understanding that even though the challenge is immense, there really isn't an alternative to dealing with it because within my lifetime even, and certainly in your generation, the generation coming up below you is going to be living with this. Lots of people find thinking about the climate crisis quite overwhelming because it is scary and it is daunting and it does feel quite uncertain that we'll have a safe future. But if we don't act on those feelings of fear and, and hurt, then what's the point in even trying? I think like my message to people is to try and turn that anxiety or, or even that apathy into something else that helps you push for change rather than just accepting that this is the way it's going to be. 
I think story. I think stories and storytelling is is a very important part of program making. You have to be very clever to do a, a story, a, a program with no story at all. I mean, you, if a viewer wants to know, you want the viewer to know, hang on, what's going to happen in next, what is going to happen now? What's going to happen? He solved that problem, but he's faced another problem. What's he going to do? Uh, and that's what, that engages people. I mean, it's a, an age-old historic thing. I'm quite sure cavemen were telling stories in which had a narrative. You know, what did the mammoth do then? Um, and it's still the same. The key to his appeal is his ability to share his genuine enthusiasm and love for the natural world. Perhaps what he is most renowned for is his signature iconic and calming voice that has formed a soundtrack to millions of childhoods and TV dinners. Many have tried, and most failed, to capture his hushed, reverential whisper, full of excitement. Really? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, I, I suppose actually, if, you, if I was to answer your question seriously, I suppose it's because I have been on television for 50 years, you know, which is a long time. Um, and, well, it's nearly 60 years, actually. Uh, and so a lot of people who hear my programs now first heard my voice when they're about two or three or four. So, I mean, there is a biological principle called imprinting, you know, whereby uh, what you see in those very early years has a profound effect on the way that you view things. And I think it may, perhaps it may be, that uh, because people have heard my voice from an early age, that they think that I know what I'm talking about, which of course is an illusion. <laughs> oh, but you do know. Uh, he's inspired us all, and I, he will for lifetimes to come. His his voice and his charisma and his love will live on through through time and generations and with a career stretching over half a century and after trekking through uncharted wilderness to film some of the most remote people and wildlife on earth attenborough has become one of the most widely respected tv broadcasters his contribution towards broadcasting and wildlife filmmaking is unparalleled. Without the passion, ambition and persistence of Attenborough and his collaborators, millions of us may never have seen some of the most spectacular scenes and rarest creatures. No one else can communicate the wonders of the natural world with quite the same blend of enthusiasm and knowledge and it is doubting that anyone in the future will be able to do so either. Beloved by millions around the world, Attenborough is a great inspiration. With warmth and intelligence, Attenborough turned his childhood passion into a lifelong career, roamed the world and took us with him, bringing the world to our doorstep. Sir David's legacy goes way beyond the screen. I remember you as an excited person, excited by what you were seeing. And what you were seeing were wild animals, the most of which we had never dreamt of. How did that person, what was the journey that led you from there to an understanding of and campaigning about climate change? Well, I suppose the only thing was that, that I simply was recording what I saw, what was there, and, and I wasn't putting any particular bias out on it. I was just witnessing it. Except for uh, excitement. Yes, except for excitement, saying how thrilling it was. That mm. was all. Uh, and uh, so I did it with a kind of naivete, but at least there was an innocence in the sense that I wasn't trying to load it one way or the other. And therefore, it, it, when you disinter it from 30 years ago, it, it, it's true. It's, what I, it's honest and it's not trying to sell you anything and therefore it becomes useful when you put it into a film like this because it is an objective statement. Right now we are in the midst of the Earth's sixth mass extinction. One every bit as profound and far-reaching as that which wiped out the dinosaurs. It's almost impossible to grasp as we go about our lives that the rest of life on Earth is experiencing destruction on the scale of that wrought by a colossal asteroid collision. Nature once determined how we survive. 
Now we determine how nature survives.